Hello and a very warm welcome to the Deutsche Welle World Economic Forum debate coming to you this time from Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is a country which spans some 17,000 islands and just six months ago, a new government was sworn in here. Economically speaking, East Asia remains the fastest growing region in the world, in a world which is still recovering from the global financial crisis. Now, many argue that the underlying factor behind every financial crisis is one thing, the absence of trust. Can we afford to live in a world where there's no trust in the way business is done? Our proposition today is trust or bust. How can trust be strengthened at the intersection of business and society? To discuss this, I have a wonderful panel for you. Let me introduce you to them, starting with Atul Singh. Atul Singh is the group president of Asia Pacific of the Coca-Cola company, the world's largest soft drinks maker. Frankie Usman Vijaya, chairman and CEO of Sinarmas Agribusiness and Food, one of Indonesia's largest conglomerates. Susie Pujastuti is an aviation tycoon, an entrepreneur, an activist, a school dropout, but above all, a minister of maritime affairs and fisheries, and a very popular minister at that, from what I've heard. Then we have Iqbal Syed, who's chairman of the Indonesian Trade Union Confederation, confrontational, combative, and charismatic, a voice in Indonesia's labor movement. And finally, Mark Vizo, President and CEO of Pact USA, a non-governmental organization for development. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our panel. <laughs> Atul, let me start with you. You come from a big corporate company. Yes. You've done extremely well wherever you work, be it in China or India. And in India, you had 22 consecutive quarters of growth. Why should you care about trust at all? I mean, you're making the profits that you need to make. <laughs> well, you know, trust is the uh, very basic foundation without which uh, I believe business is not going to thrive. Um, I've been fortunate working for the Coca-Cola company that operates in over 200 countries, and we've been around for over 128 years. And brands to us mean a lot, uh, with, of course, brand Coca-Cola as a leading brand. A uh, brand is a promise, and a great brand is a promise kept. And without trust, consumers are not going to buy a brand that, that uh, they consume. So we believe that it's at the absolute fundamental to doing business. We'll come back to that. Atul, we'll talk more about the brand. But Frankie, you're also uh, the head of a large empire. Surely it's the dollar which is driving your business and not some kind of nebulous concept of trust? Well, uh, I think... It's uh, quite fortunate that uh, my father established uh, Cinemas Group, uh, which is already about 76 years, 77 years coming. And uh, uh, he said, uh, trust is more important than his life. So it's, it's built in our DNA, actually, uh, uh, as a corporate. And uh, I think this is some, uh, very fortunate that we build everything based on trust. And uh, we can give, I can give you an example that, especially in our agribusiness, which we developed uh, already about uh, 300 schools, more than 300 schools, 40,000 students, and about 150 clinics uh, surrounding, so that uh, we really give a lot of uh, interaction with the, with the community, so that wherever we operate, uh, they really appreciate our presence. Uh, that, that trust building uh, is also important to interact. Uh, in Indonesia, they, they said, tidak dikenal, tidak disayang. So we need to communicate our uh, philosophy and sincerely what we try to do with them and really uh, benefit uh, the society. Iqbal, let me turn to you. Now, you've often been in confrontation with companies. You brought this city, Jakarta, to a standstill with your strikes. Do you believe business leaders when they tell you trust is a part of my DNA, trust is a part of our core principle of our business? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we need the investment come to the Indonesia. We need uh, uh, a lot of uh, employer come to the Indonesia. Yeah, but the other side, we need uh, welfare. We need the increasing purchasing power, not only increasing the economic growth, like Indonesia and developing countries in the world. 
uh, a lot of developing country make increasing in, uh, economic growth, but the other side they have the Gini increasing Gini index also. It means we have a lot of gap the income uh, for the people, including for the labor, and it means economic growth only benefit for middle up class, not middle low, including labor. For example, in Indonesia and developing country, country, we still have the low wages policies. So we trust uh, employer and investor come to the, our countries, but the other side, the other side, we need welfare and uh, increasing minimum wage. This is my opinion. So you're saying that you're not against investments, but you want the investments to yes. focus more on improving yes. also the lot yes, of the workers of course. in Indonesia. Yes, of course. Yeah. When the increasing economic mm. growth, mm. so the other side, government should be uh, make the reduce the Gini index. This is very fair. When employer getting some profit, mm. so they should be redistribute the income. We don't need the low wages policy. We need the equal income salary. This is. We'll go into that in larger detail, but I want to first talk yeah. to get a voice from the government. Now, Susie, you are now in the government. There's very low trust levels of CEOs, but you're on the government, and government leaders have even lower trust levels than CEOs. Do people trust you less now that you've joined the government of president uh, uh, in, in October? Uh, I think uh, somehow in my uh, let's let's go back to my what what I had in my life. That's actually I I starting from uh, drop out from my school, and then up to now is all built on based on trust that actually I've done my best as much as I can and being consistent and finally people give me a trust. Also when I start with my fisheries uh, businesses, I start my export because the Japanese give me a trust to, to, to give us red cloth LC that we can export in the first time because it was almost <laughs> impossible 1996 on the crisis starting in Indonesia to have the, to borrow money from the bank to be able to export. So my first export was basically based on on a trust of one of my Japanese buyer who trust to give us 100% red cloth LC and we can uh, deliver the products. And then also later on up to the aviation because then the bank trusts and we can grow up. The, uh, it it's needs sometimes to 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 build up and earn the trust from the society to the business uh, person. But uh, by the time it takes me four years to, to get the first two aircraft from uh, the, the, the money from the bank to be able to buy the two first aircraft. Mm -hmm. And then we had uh, the tsunami service and then we continue with the airline business because people trust our, our flights. And so you've moved from business to government. Have you seen your trust levels drop since then? Uh, I, don't, I don't see on that point. <laughs> Is there a few things that we should, uh, uh, in Indonesia especially, with so much uh, natural resources, and Indonesia well known as number two largest coastal line in the world, but in fact that our export of seafood still uh, number five in Southeast Asia, that's still a, a, a lot trust to be built to bring more investor to Indonesia to to do and develop the good business from from fisheries. So I have to tell all of you here that in fact Susie has the highest approval rating of all ministers in Indonesia. So obviously mm. she still has not lost her trust value. Let me just draw in Mark at this level. Mark, you work in development and you of often implement projects for governments in different parts of the world, as well as for foundations like Coca-Cola, 150 projects in 30 countries. How difficult is it for you to convince people that trust is a currency which is important for the uh, greater good of society? Well, I think it's a fascinating question. I mean, you know, uh, 
trust is such an emotional, personal thing. And so how do you take something that's so intangible like that and somehow quantify it and make it tangible like a currency? That in and of itself is a challenge. You know, trust is, um, I think, um, hard to get and easy to lose. Um, and so I think that where it starts is it starts by the very essence of why there's an engagement. Um, do people, it's, it's, it's no different than with, with individuals or families or communities, mm -hmm. it all comes from a genuine sincerity. And if there's a genuineness of shared values, <coughs> of shared intent, of a translation from um, stakeholders to joint shareholders of something, then you have a good basis for that dialogue that can, can through transactions of fulfilling the promise, um, be proof points of why we should have that trust. You see, now all of you have made a very strong a commitment to making trust a core value in your business, in your operations, in your lifestyle. But the statistics show that, in fact, just 20% of the general public believes what business leaders tell them and believe that business leaders take ethical and moral decisions. And yet, a survey by Edelman shows that 86% of the general public believe that it is possible for business to take decisions which are for the good of society, at the same time they enhance profit. So obviously there's a big gap between the perception of the general public about trust and what they believe can be done. Frankie, let me start with you again on this issue. Now your company, Sinar Mas, has had a rough time. Uh, you had a stage in 2009, 2010, where various multinationals boycotted palm oil uh, from your company, Nestle and Unilever. Then recently, in 2013, you had another problem with uh, smog and haze due to the burning of uh, palm oil plantations. Yours was one of the companies which was singled out as being perhaps responsible. How do you deal with this drop in trust? How do you reorganize your value chain to make sure that the trust comes back from the people? Well, uh, it's a very good question, and thank you for the question, because this is the opportunity for us uh, to really clarify uh, and gain the trust back. Uh, actually, we have done a lot uh, in the sense that uh, for the policy which the government has given us, uh, we always uh, try to do more than that. For example, zero burning policy. We have adopted that for, a, uh, let's say, the government said, uh, this year start and then we already started three years back and also uh, non-pit uh, uh, planting actually the government already given us uh, three meters that you could plant uh, uh, below three meters so we have said with zero uh, pit uh, soil planting for the uh, few years back so these are the few things that we have done but uh, i think we have not been communicating that enough so uh, maybe uh, this is a good platform uh, to really communicate uh, each of uh, initiative that we are doing. And uh, actually, I'm also uh, very fortunate to co-chair the PISA Agro so-called uh, Partnership for uh, Indonesia Sustainable Agriculture. So how can we also help not only just ourselves, but uh, the, uh, the industry itself, the palm oil industry <coughs> and other crops uh, to be sustainable? And that platform really built trust together between the uh, private public partnerships. And how can we build that trust basically is to have the measurement, uh, uh, the KPIs, and really they feel that uh, the, the sincere care is there. And uh, we have been successfully uh, having about three years launching of the Pisagro, and uh, we have 86,000 uh, farmers has been uh, <coughs> feeling that, that uh, this platform has been helping them in terms of the, uh, elevating their poverty line. Uh, by increasing their yield uh, and also certainly the, the productivity and, and their income. Arthur, can you measure something like trust? You said trust was an important part yeah, of your Yeah, sure. Uh, we actually measure trust mm -hmm. um, and corporate reputation, which is another proxy for trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very pleased to uh, announce that, uh, you know, overall, a company like ours, when you go around the world, again, 200 countries, uh, and we don't measure every country, but, but most of the major ones, we have a very high trust rating. You know, c consumers, uh, you know, we, we c uh, consumers consume over a couple of billion drinks per day. And they vote with their wallet every day. And, and, and this is across the board. And they won't do that if they didn't trust the quality of our products. Consumers today buy from companies that they trust. 
we believe in sustainability as core to our foundation of doing business. This is not a CSR that we do on the side somewhere. Every aspect of our value chain, whether it is farmers that we deal with in Africa, in Asia, other parts around the world, we work with them, we work with their yields, we work with, you know, for example, in India, drip irrigation, partnering with different, uh, different uh, uh, people within our value chain to make sure that we can help them sustain a good livelihood. Uh, Iqbal talked about uh, employ, uh, employment uh, and wages, etc. So, you know, we ensure that across the value chain, we are supporting different stakeholders and more importantly, communities in which we operate. Not only where our bottling plants are located, but also communities where we sell our products. You know, working with, uh, we have a program in fact with PACT uh, called the 5 by 20. We've made a global commitment of empowering 5 million women by the year 2020. That's just one example. Yeah, but and yeah, all but of this adds to trust. But the point is that uh, you're obviously selling the highest number of soft drinks in the world, so you must be doing something right at Coca-Cola. But at the same time, I mean, sales are falling, and there's Coca-Cola is projected to lose some 2,000 um, employees this year. And there's also been controversy about various projects which Coca-Cola has taken. For example, in Britain, the anti-obesity project. Coca-Cola wanted to set up some 70 parks, fitness parks. And that was, there's a huge outcry amongst the public and amongst many experts that this is a disingenuous attempt to distract from the fact that Coca-Cola carries a lot of sugar. Yeah. So at the same time, I think one has to be very careful about where the trust factor lies. So obviously you're also facing some tough challenges. Oh sure, there are, there are uh, issues, there are challenges across the board. You know, uh, you mentioned obesity, that's one of them. Uh, water, we were at, at one point in time challenged on the water usage. Because, you know, we're in the water business uh, and we were challenged on water. But I'm very happy to say that in lots of countries around the world, we actually put back more water into the ground than we use in our products. And we've made a commitment but that by the year 2020, we'll be water neutral. That means we will actually, through rainwater harvesting, check dams, other innovative processes, use less water, put back more water into the ground than we take out. Obesity, it's a complex issue. It's about calories in versus calories out. We want to be part of the solution. We want to be able but to work with society. But the point is people society. don't trust you to be part of the solution. I that is so. the bottom line I think here. So. I think people so. People don't trust you because they say that you are trying to use a branding technique, you're trying to use a program to actually distract from the problem. There are some people who say that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, Britain is one example. There are a couple of others. But by far and large, when you look at the couple of hundred countries in which we operate, we have what we call the golden triangle, civil society, government, and corporates. We are the facilitator that brings all together to find solutions. What, I want to be part of a solution. We have an issue. Obesity is an issue. You know? Now, let's not debate as to how it's being caused. Let's sure. find a solution. And I think when you look at working with government, working with NGOs, <coughs> civil society, other companies, we're finding solutions. And for, uh, creating trust. I mean, that is the currency, Absolutely. creating trust. Now, um, Susie, you are facing many challenges as well. As I mentioned, Indonesia comprises of some 17,000 islands, the second largest coastline in the world, and you are the minister for fisheries. So you have a lot of challenges ahead of you. How are you dealing in terms of policy, tackling some of the issues that you're facing right now? Okay, so the, the biggest problem in, in, in Indonesia that I'm facing when I was in my office uh, is the fact that Indonesia, the second largest coastal line in the world, but number five in Southeast Asia, that's put very far gap, which I have to bring them together in line. Uh, why that's happened? Because Indonesia's uh, natural resources, basically fisheries, had been taken so much by so many illegal fishing in Indonesia, which uh, then I was seeing it's almost impossible to handle it in a smoother way. So what we do, I issue the moratorium policy for the ex-foreign fishing vessel, mm -hmm. which indicating that many of them duplicating the license to fish in the waters. So those uh, early days, we had about 1,300 uh, fishing vessel that operate in our water. 
but duplicate both, it's at least five to seven times, and some of them even 10 times. And that's what cost in the last 15 years, uh, 115 companies in around Java and few islands are collapsed they, because they don't have raw material anymore, had been taken away mm -hmm. in the sea. And that was also because we allowing transshipment in the sea to basically taking and exporting direct in the middle of the sea. So no, no, no checkpoint, harbor, no nothing. Mm -hmm. So the second policy that I made was the banning transshipment in the middle of the <laughs> sea. So everything has to be go to the port and checkpoint. And we also indicating that there had been so many <laughs> inappropriate practices on those illegal fishing with the slavery issues and many things. And this will cost Indonesia, there's nobody want to invest anything in fisheries because there's no picture. It's, it's not an uh, interesting picture that, yes, potential are there. Mm -hmm. And actually, we can be one of the most dominant and uh, important uh, player in, in, in seafood businesses with our source size. Yeah. Well, you have a lot, big problem with illegal fishing, and you took yes. a very drastic measure to deal with illegal fishing recently. Uh, we have to, with seven what, what to 10,000 boats, they are using our national fuel mm -hmm. Uh, capacity and they're also taking fish from the from our waters not only fish shrimps and all other sourcing that we can we lose uh, and now the result is that we are saving at least 25 percent of national fuel consumption and the second almost uh, five to six million tons of fish uh, basically can be uh, so that's a popular measure uh, uh, to uh, deal with illegal fishing is a popular measure with the fishing community in Indonesia, but perhaps an unpopular measure for your neighboring countries who've been living off illegally of your fish. Uh, we had uh, I, I, first I take step to invite all the ambassadors of the neighborhood that the fishermen are uh, basically come around. So we discussed the issues and we all agreed that illegal fishing is not only Indonesian problem, mm -hmm. but also many countries' problem. And an inappropriate and very unfriendly fishing method is also taking place with uh, cost damage and destruction for the environment. And all the excellency, the ambassadors from all surrounding neighborhoods are also agreed mm -hmm that illegal fishing is not only Indonesian enemy, it's a global enemy. Yeah. So we come to the point that uh, yes, because we, the new government, Jokowi, and, uh, want to, to put our future of the nation is in the ocean, yeah. which is very realistic mm. to see the size of, of the sea is two thirds of our country. Yeah. And we situated in, in Equatorial, that's uh, basically very, very rich of, uh, of fisheries uh, sources. And, uh, uh, but the homework, big homework uh, is there. And the only thing to, when things are so bad and had been happened for many years. Yes, you have to deal with them. I think the important uh, 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 message I'm getting from you, that they are often competing interests when it comes to trust. Mark, you deal with so many different projects and organizations. How does one create trust when there are competing interests involved? What is good for one person may not be good for the other person. As Atul told us, they're doing a lot of work at community development, yet you have some consumers who don't trust the company. Now, um, what Susie has just told us, good for one person but not for the other. How do you d reconcile these different interests in your projects that you uh, deal well, with? Well, I think, isn't that always the case? There's never unanimity. You know, in families and communities and businesses and relationships between consumers and businesses or <coughs> constituents and governments, there's always going to be someone who's dissatisfied. And I think that that's going to be the reality. And so I'm not sure you can actually reconcile it holistically. But I think what you can do is have seriousness and genuineness of intent. Um, not, not to uh, uh, help out our, our poor friends at Coca-Cola, but um, there's always going to be an issue with people thinking that sugar drinks are causing obesity, or, sure. or as uh, uh, Coca-Cola refers to it often, overnutrition, um, which is an interesting uh, way to put it. But uh, there's also actions that can demonstrate that intent of wanting to have everybody um, be whole. 
to have this um, sincerity of interest of shared purpose. And so Coca-Cola has uh, produced a whole uh, set of lines of drinks that are um, zero calories or different ways to do it. And so that plus being a water neutral company by 2020 when their single uh, biggest uh, ingredient is water, you know, it's, it's mind boggling. So I think, you know, for, for PACT, when we work with different companies, um, there are some companies that we think it's not quite right for us to partner with. And it's not because of what they do or what they don't do inherent in their business. We all are users of whatever these folks produce. It's about the intent behind it. Are they looking at people as stakeholders or as shareholders? Mm -hmm. um, are they trying to have an honest, genuine dialogue about how you co-create and discover what's mm -hmm. best for all? Um, r r real quickly, I was on a panel um, talking about Nigeria with Rhonda Zagaki, who's executive vice president at Chevron. And she mentioned just before we went on stage um, that that very week, uh, Chevron was celebrating the fact that they had been in Nigeria for 100 years. And if you go into a uh, community, into a country with that mm -hmm. as your mindset, even before the 100 year starts, you approach things differently. And it's about the genuineness of shared purpose. Right. Um, Iqbal, I want to ask you now, uh, you've been working a lot on improving the lot of workers uh, in Indonesia, and you've been focusing on things like minimum wage has been a very important issue for you, the health scheme, insurance, pension for workers. How confident are you with the new government here, with President Joko Widodo, that the workers, is there an environment of trust where the workers' needs will be addressed? Yeah, yes. We have concern about the some priority issue in labor. First, about the decent wages against the low wages policies and uh, social security reform and against the precarious work or outsourcing and then uh, uh, against the union busting and etc. So uh, the new president, the new government in Indonesia, we cannot look uh, looking for, forward yeah, and uh, make the new regulation for better life for the laborers. For example, uh, in these years, uh, Jokowi president had to sign about the uh, government regulation uh, pension system. Follow the law uh, last year's in the November, uh, President already signed. But until now, President not yet signed for the pension system. Why? You know, we need the pension system. I don't know why not. Mm. I don't know. Uh, I think the Nawacita program, the names of the uh, Jokowi's uh, president, uh, he, he called uh, about the pension system and health insurance uh, for the people. But until now, uh, he doesn't sign the uh, regulation of the pension system. It means in July of this year, uh, workers cannot uh, getting the pension. No implementation of the pension system in Indonesia. It means labor side, labor side Jokowi don't care the labor issue. Mm -hmm. And the other side, you know, Ahok, the governor of Jakarta, mm -hmm. Uh, already decided minimum wage, approximately 2.7 uh, million rupiah, approximately uh, 200, 250, 250 dollars. It's very low. If you compare the Thailand, you compare the Philippines, you compare the Malaysia, but Indonesia economic growth have the number two in the world after Chinese GDP purchasing power parity number 15 last year mm -hmm. and number 10 this year. Indonesia become the rich country, number 10 GDP purchasing power parity, but low wages policy still operate in Indonesia. That's because they want to attract more investment. Is that your idea? That they have a low wage policy as a selling Indonesia to get more investment? Yes, I think yes. But I want to ask you, now you have often talked about taking the militant way in the labor movement, having these massive strikes, one million people on the streets, you bring the city to a standstill, and you've described that as a means to an end, to improve the lives of workers. But will that create trust? Will companies trust you if you bring things to a standstill? 
Yes. We because we don't understand what do we do when government still interest and focus only in fight the lot of investment. But the other said the government cannot implement it, the rules. The rule is already, the law is already, but cannot implement it. Like decent wages, pension system, health insurance, labor still limited getting the health insurance. A lot of people, including labor, uh, come to the hospital, refuse from the hospital. This is problem. A lot of outsourcing in the state-owned enterprise. State-owned enterprise have the government, but still use the outsourcing or precarious workers. It is paradox. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If you look the government policies, Jokowi policies, paradox. They want to increasing economic growth, but the other said, we have the paradox economic growth. Low wages, increasing Gini index, limited social, social, prote social protection floor, and etc. Frankie, how do we get out of this paradox? Now, this is a problem which is not un uh, it's universal. It's just not limited to Indonesia, where you have growth, but that growth is unevenly distributed. There can be no trust if there's uneven growth and the disparity between rich and poor keeps growing. I certainly agree about this parity has to be uh, bring to the closest as possible. And uh, uh, to be fair to the uh, Jokowi's uh, and JK um, administration, I think they're just six months. Mm. So there's a lot of uh, uh, problems uh, that, that has to be, uh, to be um, what you call it, prioritized. Certainly this is very important priority uh, for the labor issues, uh, I think, um, but I have a confidence that our government <laughs> is doing the right things. Uh, first, of course, because of the currency has been weakened, because U.S. dollar has been strengthened against all other currency, and then the commodity prices came down quite substantially. So the buying power has been reduced by 20 to 30 uh, percent. So that is maybe one of the consideration. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, the priority in how to make sure that we're coming out from this uh, temporary slowdown so that uh, everybody can gain from this uh, uh, economic growth. Uh, I fully agree with Iqbal that uh, we need to put more attention on that, uh, how to find the middle ground uh, to make sure that when the company grow, the, the country grow, uh, the workers also feel uh, the, the their, um, uh, what you call it, welfare will be taken care of. So I think that is a very fair statement, but uh, we just have to be a little bit patient because, uh, as again, uh, uh, the president has said, we're just six months. There's a lot of uh, debottlenecking that has to be done. Uh, so that trust uh, has to be developed among, within sure. I with Iqbal, yeah. stakeholders, yeah. and the government. <laughs> yeah, I, no. I might say, in, uh, I mean, this is the thing I see in the pre this new government. It's a big, actually, uh, how you call it, they're very keen to change things. Mm -hmm. And change is also a word that is attract me to join, uh, to take the part of the government role. And uh, it, it, it is a lot of uh, things that we have to change from, from a different uh, uh, management perspective and also in a way that uh, uh, the economy had been growth so far. I do agree with ba, what ba Iqbal said that uh, the growth of the economy is not reflecting into the prosperity of the, 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 the basically the lowest uh, or the group of people that is the labor and really really the, the people in the villages but uh, I think the government are put already the, the, the effort and the interest that they are. Of course, we have to, to <coughs> battle. The first thing is the fuel subsidies that had been taking so much of the country money every year. We almost spend 400 uh, trillion, this is about four forty billion uh, dollars into subsidizing fuel. And I told you before that illegal fishing is using almost uh, 
almost a quarter of the whole country fuel consumption. Right. So you see those subsidies had been misused and mm -hmm. had been hard for the country. And now without this, uh, this inefficiency in fuel subsidies, we're expecting that we can do better. And we see we struggle with the, with the, with the budgeting month also. Mm -hmm. Since also, and I see we cannot change that much either in this year of budgeting uh, allocations because the budget that we are running and spending in this 2015 mm -hmm. is basically designed by the government before with different prioritize on, on things. So Yeah, because so. Uh, fuel subsidies, as I've been reading, is a very <coughs> controversial issue in Indonesia. Let me just bring in Atul once again and turning away from Indonesian sure. politics for a sense, uh, for a minute. Uh, Atul, as we were talking about, I mentioned those anti-obesity campaign just as an example of public trust. Now, obviously, Coca-Cola is doing a lot of other work which is trying to contribute back to society. But to what extent is trust a competitive advantage for a corporate company like yours? Oh, I think it's a huge competitive advantage. Uh, if consumers trust you, trust your quality, trust your product, uh, trust the values that the brand, the company stands for, uh, they actually vote with their wallet. They buy your products. Uh, you know, uh, AC Nielsen uh, did a study uh, uh, over 30,000 consumers around the world. And in fact, it was interesting, that study found that, in, especially in Asia Pacific, in Asia, 64% of consumers were actually uh, preferred to buy products from a company that they would trust and a company that would would work towards sustainability, towards the environment, uh, towards social well-being. And I think that's important. 21st century companies uh, have got to focus uh, not only on you know, the, the, the profit angle, if you will, uh, but, but also on a balanced scorecard. I mean, we have to be able to grow our businesses without growing the carbon footprint, for example. You have to grow our businesses uh, with using less on, on uh, per unit of electricity, if you yeah, use electricity, etc. But do you believe there's a regional a, a variation in trust? Now, you worked in four continents, sure. and research shows that small and medium-sized companies run by families are trusted the world over, sure. apart from Asia. So what are the regional variations you, do you see that where trust is placed uh, in well, Asia? Well, you know, if, if people have a bad experience, mm -hmm. if you've had bad experience, and in today's world with the internet, with uh, you know, mobile technology, mm -hmm. uh, something that goes wrong, that, that news spreads like wildfire. I mean, almost instantaneously you can get that news uh, elsewhere. So I think uh, you know, it's, it's an evolving, changing dynamics. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to comment it, why people in in Asia trust you know family businesses less than, than others. Maybe there's been a bad experience that that people in communities have had uh, with with uh, uh, certain companies exploiting communities, for example. But clearly, the world over, uh, and and we operate as I said, the world over, and we've found the many great companies around the world. You know, uh, not just ours, many great companies around the world. If you contribute to society. And if you give back to society, you're going to be around for 100 years. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a Chevron in Nigeria or a Coca-Cola in, 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 in the US or in, in, in other parts of the world, uh, if you contribute back to society, and that is both for, for companies that are privately owned, they're great examples of privately owned on, uh, companies of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. whom people trust a lot. Uh, and there's several examples around the world. So I would just say that you know, trust it doesn't matter whether you're pr publicly owned, privately owned, multinational, uh, or, or limited in, in a certain geography. Uh, it all depends on the values that you live by. But research has shown that actually geography does play a certain role in which companies are trusted. The research has shown, for example, the BRICS countries, India, China, Russia, are less trusted companies from these countries. And the country which is most trusted, uh, I'm pleased to report, this is not my research, is Germany, followed by Switzerland, Sweden, and Canada and that's because they believe public perception, again, this is all public perception, is that these countries pay more attention to looking after employees, communities, and the environment. But that's by the by. Mark, I want to ask you, is there a trade-off when companies put trust at the core of their business? Is there a trade-off? And if companies are not trustworthy, can they go bust? 
Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think we have to be careful. If you use putting trust at the core of your business as a methodology to gain greater sales, it will be seen as disingenuous and backfire. And so I think that it comes back to, I'm sorry to be a broken record, but you know, what is the, 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 the intent of a shared values with folks that engage with you in a um, uh, business transaction? And if you're trying to manipulate your image, uh, PR, or trying to be seen as trustworthy, people will see through that. And, and, and it's, it's the same with people. Right? It's, it's no different. I'm sure there's geographic differences. Um, Edelman's done a lot of research on trust, and, and, and some of the, 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 the data shows that, that, that it's true. I think one of the things that can happen when you have had a bad experience, uh, I don't think that necessarily kills an opportunity for trust. I think a, a bad experience admitted honestly, openly, and then rectified can actually ironically deepen trust. And so it's all about that genuineness um, and the, so you can't fake trust, is what you're saying. I think you can give it a really good try, <laughs> and I think it'll la it'll work for a long time. But at the end of the day, particularly in communities where um, there's not a lot of fungible resources, where you know you're earning a dollar, two dollars a day, um, you lose trust very quickly if there's not um, authenticity. You know, that's, it's a question of authenticity. Uh, Susie, I have to come back to you because from what I have heard and read about you, it's not what you say, it's what you do. Your life was transformed, you wrote by your own admission, during the 2004 tsunami. What is the story there? Okay, so uh, I had two aircraft on those days, um, still about a month. Uh, and running my fisheries business, taking the... the live lobster and uh, the fresh fish to Jakarta. And then the tsunami happened, we helped the people for two weeks, that was only the plan. But then people, I'll oh, keep the plane here. I said, I can't, I don't have enough cash anymore to run free flights. So then the trust from all the NGOs basically to charter our aircraft. And that's how we're starting our, 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 our charter business. And then we get more and more and more. So actually, two business that I have uh, starting by, by, it, by without helping, business plan. So. Uh, and helping the people of the tsunami. And Indonesia yeah. was the worst yeah. affected country during and, the tsunami. And yeah. I believe, I think uh, you're right, that sincerity and genuity are very important actually mm -hmm. to gain the trust or mm -hmm. to win the trust in the first place. But for the long run, commitment that you, you keep, uh, you, you, you give share of what you earn mm -hmm. back to the, to the, to the stakeholders or to your buyer or to your customer. Uh, what Coca-Cola do, basically giving back and, and incentive to the, to the user of your product will always be uh, your benefit back, basically will benefit you back. So what you do in, in the normal market, it will always, it's always uh, become go back to you. And, and just starting from those two airplanes, you now have more than 30 airplanes and your airline we is called 50 Su aircraft now 50 flying aircraft. And around. And your airline is called Suzy Air. Is yes. That right? So I, I always <laughs> say to my Japanese buyer, I put my name, so that's a life guarantee. Oh, wonderful. So for the quality. <laughs> Thank you. So that's to hold the trust from yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> I won't mess around because I can't change my name. So <laughs> that's what I said. <laughs> now, Frank, you and Susie talks that's about right. honesty and, and sincerity and trust. I mean, most people simply don't associate this with uh, a business, right? Now, you are associated with so many boardrooms. You know so many directors. You're associated with many companies. Is trust a boardroom agenda or is it just something that HR does and sounds good like diversity? Can one make that a boardroom agenda, the concept of trust? Well, I think, um, the, as I said, it's very lucky that my father, Eka Cipta Wijaya, has put that in the forefront of everything. So he said, trust is more important than his life. Then this become our guiding principle and has been embedded in, the, in our, in our but core are value. Other companies are like your companies? Is uh, that, uh, so basically, all, all the, uh, the group's company has been, these are the basic things. Uh, everybody has to understand this. And uh, we translate that into our action. So in, in all the business plan, we always uh, allocate certain, it's not just CSR, but more than that, how we accompany the, society, the, 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 the people on the ground to really benefit from what we are we're doing. So to gain the trust is not, uh, not built in one day, but it, it takes time. 
So uh, we have been around for uh, more than uh, nearly 80 <coughs> years. So uh, I hope we gain some trust in that. Right. Thank you, Frankie. I mean, obviously, your company, as you say, is part of your DNA, but I'm still kind of worried about the broader corporate aspect and the role of trust there. Iqbal, what do you feel? You've listened to what everybody's saying. You've listened to the government voice. You've listened to the corporate voices. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, are you optimistic about trust being at the center of labor relations? You have to deal with trust with companies, but there's also a lack of trust within and between different unions. Yeah, we should be optimistic for the life because so must be gone. on. We cannot back uh, the, uh, for the experience. We need the future. For example, in Indonesia and developing country, yeah, we have paradox economic growth. Yeah? And we can look, if, if you look in the employer side, for example, yeah, in the Nike, uh, Adidas, uh, uh, pay the tiger wood for the uh, uh, showing in the television five million dollars. <coughs> pay the uh, labor for the salary per month approximately in Indonesia 2040. It is not fair. So we need fairness. We need fair trade, not free trade only. So it means is union side, we need four requirements. First, mutual trust, partnership equality, transparency, and accountability. You can getting a lot of profit, but if you already getting profit, please redistribute to the labor. It is trust. Not uh, doubt give the sum uh, uh, salary, decent wages, and uh, social protection. So we need the mutual trust and equality. Mutual trust. So it can't be a one-way uh, one trust. Yeah. Okay, there's no one here, I think, from Nike at the moment to respond to your, your comments, but maybe somebody from the audience will. But before I ask the audience to join in, I want to uh, ask you, Mark, a final question. <coughs> Listening to what Iqbal had to say just now, is there a disconnect about what we mean by trust. A company means by trust delivering on time, giving a good product like Coca-Cola, but what Iqbal's talking about is fairness and ethics and you know, underpinning business. Is there a fundamental disconnect about how we deal with this issue of trust? Yeah, I think so. I think that's p part of the issue. You know, some of Edelman's research talks about what, what do industries think builds up trust and what then consumers think about build up trust. And you, if you, if you, if, as an industry, you look at uh, the quality of your services, for example, and you think that's the thing that builds up trust, and you spend a lot of time measuring that, how well people see your quality, you get this false sense of trust when consumers or, or, or people in the community where your um, uh, plants might be uh, value something else as building up trust. You have this gap. You, you, you don't communicate. And so I think it's important to have an ongoing, honest conversation. I think one of the things that Iqbal, you mentioned, is, is really key, that, that trust is such a human emotion, such an intangible thing, that, that, that transparency is key yeah. to making it more tangible. Um, when you have, uh, and you're not afraid uh, to, to, to share and to show uh, and to be found out, uh, then uh, trust comes, even when things aren't as much as right as they should be. Um, and that in, 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 in encourages dialogue. And so I think if, if you can make sure we have an honest dialogue about what certain people see as critical to trust and compare that to how we see it, we begin to start the conversation that's, that's fruitful. And I think we've had a very interesting conversation so far. And to my great surprise, I thought there'd be a lot of divergences in approach to the idea of trust. But I am very pleasantly surprised there is a great deal of commonality on the importance of trust and what it needs to have, what needs to be done to have mutual trust. Now, we've heard some very interesting ideas here shared by our panelists. I would now invite our audience uh, to ask questions. I would request you to raise your hand. Uh, I think a microphone will come to you, or maybe do we have microphones at all? We do have microphones, uh, uh, two gentlemen here, so raise your hands, uh, they'll come to you. Uh, would you kindly identify yourself, who you are, and State your question, keep it brief, and if possible, identify the person who should answer that question for you. So who would like to ask a question? The gentleman there. 
I'm Bernd Waltermann from the Boston Consulting Group. I'm pleasantly surprised that I originate from the country which seems to be most <laughs> trusted. And I've had the pleasure of working in Indonesia for the last 20 years. Um, I have a question to Pa Iqbal. Um, I hear your point and sympathize with your agenda of improving the safety net for the workers. Now, foreign investors, they need the trust, and they have trust if there is some degree of predictability. Now, we have experienced some stark increases in some minimum wages in some regions in the past. And I have two questions. One, how can we make these a little bit more predictable for investors, number one? Number two, you had some comparison with other ASEAN countries, which are probably right, but we have to take the productivity part into account as well, where some of these countries seem to be advantaged. So what does it mean for productivity increases in Indonesia, and shouldn't we then embrace outsourcing, embrace some new technologies, which may be leading to some short-term pain for some companies and employment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, like I said, we have increasing economic growth is very higher. But the other side, we have increase of Gini index also increasing. It means we have a lot of gap, middle up class and middle low, including labor. If you look the data by ILO, International Labor Organization, uh, salary compared by Thailand, Philippines, and Malaysia, Indonesia less than. For example, in Jakarta, no, we have uh, approximately $240 uh, dollars per month. In Thailand, approximately $320 <coughs> dollars per month. Philippines, more than. And Yes, if we compare the Cambodia, Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos, yes, Indonesia more than. But product purchasing power parity in Indonesia more than Philippines, Thailand, and uh, Kuala Lumpur. It is not fair. So step by step, the labor movement in Indonesia want to uh, become the decent wages, like the last form, last president. Uh, SBY said Indonesia become middle income country but if you look the uh, 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 what's the meaning labor intensive industry is very low wages policy including uh, uh, the capital intensive like Preford, Coca-Cola, Sinarmas I think still make the low wages policies because follow the minimum wages policies from government. So we want to change paradigm. When economic growth increasing, purchasing power for people, including labor, also increasing. If purchasing power increasing, it means domestic consumption increasing. If domestic consumption increasing, it means economic growth also increasing. So we have the strategy, not only action. We call concept, first step concept, the second step uh, uh, lobby, negotiate, social dialogue, and the last action. If, if uh, our concept don't accept from government and employer, and follow the rule, not uh, a radical, radical action. Sure. This is our opinions. Yeah, that was, as you heard, a very passionate uh, defense of your position. Thank you very much for that, Iqbal. Uh, any other question? At the back, sorry. Iqbar, could you just a moment, if you just oh, wait for. Iqbar, can you comment on the level of skilled workers here? You're comparing Philippines, Thailand, and other countries. Can you uh, can I elaborate on your opinion on the level of skilled workers in Indonesia versus other countries, for one? and to what your group is doing to educate the labor force on being better skilled workers, uh, taking personal initiative. Yeah. Iqbal, if you give a short answer to that. Okay. Yeah? I follow the McKinsey Global Institute data. They said 2005 until 2010 years, 67 percentage 
productivity of Indonesian labor give for the economic growth? This is McKenzie data, not me. If you want to, like said uh, brothers, uh, uh, about the productivity, you should be compare apple to apple, head to head, not GDP. Because we have a lot of uh, 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 number of the people. Toyota Indonesia, head to head Toyota Thailand. I believe because the Toyota, our members, I believe the workers of Toyota Indonesia more than productivity in the Thailand. You can look in Nova uh, uh, kind of the Toyota. A lot of Innova imp uh, export to the other countries. This is our opinion. Head to head, apple right. to apple, if yeah. productivity compared. Thank you, Iqbal. Uh, more questions? This lady here in black. If you can identify yourself and the person. Hi, I'm Bhagya from the Straits Times, Singapore. My question is for Minister Suzy. Uh, now, your policy against illegal fishing, it's involved seizing and even sinking boats, foreign boats from you know, fellow ASEAN countries, from the Philippines to Vietnam and even China. Uh, my question is, this comes at a time when ASEAN is actually coming together to form the AEC. Mm -hmm. So do you wish you would handle this a little differently how do you intend to resolve this issue? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so for the opportunity to have this question so I can answer. So back again that what I said, Indonesian had been for 20 years, almost, I think, can even be more, we don't know, so that thousands of boats are fishing in our waters. The last 15 years, 115 companies have been collapsing. And uh, fishermen alone are getting less and less and difficult into getting their fish, even for, even for eating only. So the, the practices of fishing is getting brutally uh, uh, done by many Indonesian coastal fisheries people, by bombing, by cyanide, and many other, that because of desperations of the of the sea sourcing that taken away that much. I mean, can you imagine if, if uh, just an example, uh, Vietnam has 1,900 boats in one time in Natuna waters. And then we captured one boat in, in February in Raja Ampat. That's the holy uh, diver site for Indonesian fishermen. I don't think any Indonesian fishermen will go fishing there and we captured one Vietnamese boat with 2,100 sax fins. Uh, imagine, 2,100 one, kilogram sax fin mean coming from 200,000 kilogram of fish. And then just the last we captured a Haifa, one tramper with 900,000 kilogram. Which is, this is a dream of many Indonesian processing plants. And this had been happened for many years and uh, nobody seems to be aware. Chokowi said we had been putting the oceans in our backyard. So memunggungi laut, he said in Bahasa. So never see it. And the fact and the reality become too much difference as the second largest uh, coastal line in the world, but we are number five in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. That is so much uh, to, to to, to see, and we had to discuss this together. Mm -hmm. Indian put that measure into Indonesian boat that entering the water. Australian had been sinking 1,500 Indonesian fishing vessel who enter Australian water in the last 10 years. But uh, we do 20 or 30 of them now, uh, almost 30, uh, in public way, mm -hmm. because yeah. the president want to give a shock treatment. Yes, he Why we it have to do shock this? Therapy, yeah. didn't shock he? therapy, the, mm -hmm. because with such a huge territorial and such a huge number, there's no other oceans have fishing poacher as much as seven to ten thousand fishing vessels, other than Indonesia. Right. You I know, think I mean, there we have to leave it, Susie. those thousand yeah. boats coming to sure. to Germany waters or England water. I imagine that's. 
And that's not small boat. It's 300, 500. The smallest is 50 to 80 gross tonnage, which average Indonesian boat, 80% um, or at, at least 70% still five gross tonnage. What can we do? We have to do something. But Susie, we have case, to leave it there. Thank okay. you very much. I'm sorry, you've all been really good about giving me very short comments during the debate. We are now running out of time. Okay. But I just want to tell you that Jokowi is the affectionate name for the Indonesian president, whose uh, full name is Joko Widodo. Joko Widodo, yes. yes. So. Um, just so that our international uh, viewers know who we are talking okay. about. Mm -hmm. Now, does anyone else have a question? We would like uh, short questions and short answers. If not, I'm going to ask Susie to tell us more about the fishing policy here. <laughs> Anyone else? A gentleman there in the pink shirt. Hello, I'm Geraint Hughes from Clifford Chance. Uh, maybe a question for a couple of panelists briefly. Mm -hmm. How important is social media to either gaining or losing trust? Okay, I'm going to give that question actually to begin with uh, to Atul and then to Frankie. Uh, well, clearly, social media is very important, um, and in today's world uh, where everyone's connected, uh, it's, it's that much more important, um, and it's a great vehicle to gain trust. You can lose it, uh, as, as my colleague here uh, mentioned, very quickly. Um, you know, we've built a business over 128 years. It may take 128 days or 128 minutes uh, to lose the trust in today's world. Uh, so, so clearly, it is important. Um, and, and it's important, uh, you know, we have to all be responsible uh, in how we use it, uh, but, uh, and, and we have to be authentic and genuine uh, so that uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, long-lasting. Uh, but uh, that's a short answer to an uh, important question of, of today's age. Thank you, Atul. What about you, Frankie? How well, uh, thanks to social media, I think uh, our president gained the popularity through social media because he was uh, coming from uh, Solo, uh, only the, uh, the, the head of the Solo, and come to Jakarta as a governor. So that, that can be really uh, powerful tools, uh, but we have to use it very responsible way. And I think that is, uh, we have to embrace uh, ICT uh, is very important for every uh, business that we're doing. I think also social media just puts so much pressure on all companies and the government because it's so easy to mobilize opinion for or against. And I think that's been, has its upsides as well as downsides for those who are affected by that. Mark, do you want to add to that? Just uh, briefly, I think, yeah. I think it's a really great question. It's sort of like how I started my favorite color gray. Social media is like Prometheus and fire. It can be good or it can bad. It can take on the color however you want to, to use it. And so I think it puts a lot of pressure on businesses, on governments to be, um, proactive um, because I think it can spread very quickly and there may be no truth to things or there may be truth that's hidden to it. It's very hard to combat it because you can't find where you get the, the source and grab it. And so I think the only way to combat something like that is uh, through, through dialogue and through gen uh, genuineness. Okay, I think uh, if there are no more questions, unless there's somebody urgently who wants to ask a question, I don't see any questions. I'm going to give each panelist 30 seconds to give me their one quick takeaway as to how they can build trust in their area of work. Starting with you, Frankie, 30 seconds. Well, Rome is not built in one day, so trust has to be embedded in the corporate and the societies so that uh, really we can build up the trust uh, over the times. Iqbal. Yeah. Uh, we need in, uh, investment come to the, our countries, but the other side, we need the decent wages, prosperity, by mutual trust, partnership, equality, transparency, and accountability. We can build the trust. Thank you. Atul? Well, trust is fundamental and the foundation of what we do, uh, and I'd said it earlier, uh, a brand is a promise, and a great brand is a promise kept. Right, thank you. That was short and sweet. Susie. Uh, trust is very important, especially for the government to continue build up and give its prosperity to the people. We need them to trust us, and transparency and good governance is is need to enforce the trust is to be there. Without that, uh, government would not able to influence and do good for the people. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mark, finally. I think having a paradigm shift and seeing engagement with communities, not as communities as stakeholders, but as shareholders for the long-term perspective goes a long way to engendering trust. Thank you. Well, uh, that brings our session uh, to an end. Now, the absence of trust has great potential to derail uh, uh, the gains we've made socially and economically. I think all of us here sitting on this podium agree that it's really important all of us, business, the government, and society, put more focus on not just value, but values, not just financial gain, but the ethics which underlie our interaction. It's time to put trust back at the heart and center of our relations. That was the DW World Economic Forum debate coming to you from Jakarta. Thank you very much for joining us wherever you are. Thank you also to the audience who's sitting with me here in Jakarta, and above all, to our wonderful panelists for a stimulating and lively debate on the issue of trust.